listen to this awakening. The hot wind beating in my face made me think of a summer day in Kentucky, of a meadow that seemed as big as the ocean to the very little girl walking through the grass, which was higher than her waist. She threw out her arms as if swimming when she walked, beating the tall grass as one strikes out in the water. I was just walking diagonally across a big field. My sunbonnet obstructed the view. I could see only the stretch of green before me, and I felt as if I must walk on forever without coming to the end of it. I don't remember whether I was frightened or pleased. I must have been entertained. I was running away from prayers, from the Presbyterian service, read in a spirit of gloom by my father that chills me yet to think of. I was a little unthinking child in those days, just following a misleading impulse without question. Sometimes I feel this summer as if I were walking through the green meadow again, idly, aimlessly, unthinking and unguided. I'm Roger, and this episode of Bookshook is all about the first half of The Awakening, published in 1899 and written by the American author Kate Chopin. So just a brief summary of the first half. We meet Léonce Pontellier, a New Orleans businessman of Louisiana Creole heritage. He's on holiday in the Gulf of Mexico in a resort managed by Madame Le Brun. He sees his wife, Edna, come out of the sea from swimming with Madame Le Brun's son, Robert, sunburnt, and scolds her, quote, You are burnt beyond recognition, looking at his wife as one looks at a valuable piece of personal property which has suffered some damage. Okay, so first impressions, this guy is a douchebag par excellence. Run away, Edna. His wife and Robert have had some adventure in the water. And I'm thinking, well, maybe he's possibly jealous of the informal and friendly relationship between Edna and Robert. They do have some banter, which I think Leonce feels alienated from. Leonce has gone swimming, but in his very buttoned up manner, he, quote, had taken a plunge at daylight. That was why the morning seemed long to him. Now, Leonce goes off to play billiards with his New Orleans friends at a local hotel. Robert is also a big hit with Edna's kids. I can see where this is going. Edna is going to have a fling with Robert because her husband pays her no interest. Let's see what happens. So when Leonce comes home, I do feel a little bit sorry for him because he feels discouraged that Edna showed, quote, so little interest in things which concerned him and valued so little his conversation. Anyway, he goes to check on the kids that are sleeping soundly, only to criticise his poor wife for being a bad mother and neglecting them. He thinks one of them is ill, clearly a misdiagnosis. All the same, he considers Edna neglectful. And I'm thinking, hold on, Leonce, you utter swine. You, my friend, have been gambling at the local casino whilst your good wife has been looking after your kids. Get a reality check, my friend. Now, just listen to his thoughts. This is his close, omniscient narration. Quote, he reproached his wife for her habitual neglect of the children. If it was not a mother's place to look after children, whose on earth was it? He himself had his hands full with his brokerage business. He could not be in two places at once, making a living for his family on the street and staying at home to see that no harm befell them. He talked in a monotonous, insistent way. So Leonce is in the money trade. This is certainly no marriage. Why are they married? Well, of course, Edna reacts to this outburst. She doesn't confront him, but the anger simmers inside. Quote, An indescribable oppression, which seemed to generate in some unfamiliar part of her consciousness, filled her whole being with a vague anguish. It was like a shadow, like a mist passing across her soul's summer day. It was strange and unfamiliar. Now this, I suppose, is the beginning of her awakening. She's certainly unconscious at the moment because she believes that Leonce has some kind of love for her. Quote, they, i.e. these feelings of oppression, seemed never before to have weighed much against the abundance of her husband's kindness and uniform devotion, which had come to be tacit and self-understood. I think those feelings were all in your mind, Edna. Anyway, Mr Pontellier goes back to the city, leaving Edna with the boys. He sends her gifts, which she shared out, and everyone thinks he is the best husband ever. Quote, Mrs Pontellier was forced to admit that she knew of no one better. And now she goes down to the beach with her friend Adele, who I think can see that Edna is in a loveless marriage. When the close omniscient narrator thinks of Edna's marriage to Leonce, she reflects that, quote, her marriage to him was purely an accident, in this respect resembling many other marriages which masquerade as the decrees of fate and the reason. 
She fancied there was a sympathy of thought and taste between them, in which fancy she was mistaken. Add to this the violent opposition of her father and her sister, Margaret, to her marriage with a Catholic, and we need seek no further for the motives which led her to accept Monsieur Pantelier for her husband. So not only does she feel shackled to her husband, but also to her children, although she can't admit it to herself. Quote, she did not miss them, except with an occasional intense longing. Their absence was a sort of relief, though she did not admit this even to herself. Now, Adele tells Robert not to be so flirty with Edna, and we learn that his father died at a young age. Madame Le Brun reflects that, quote, the conduct of the universe and all things pertaining thereto would have been manifestly of a more intelligent and higher order had not Monsieur Le Brun been removed to other spheres during the early years of their married life. What a lovely turn of phrase. Poor Madame Le Brun. Now, a Mademoiselle Riche plays the piano and Enna is moved beyond words. Quote, the very passions themselves were aroused within her soul, swaying it, lashing it as the waves daily beat upon her splendid body. She trembles, she was choking and the tears blinded her. Edna is clearly falling for Robert Quote, She missed him the days when some pretext served to take him away from her Just as one misses the sun on a cloudy day Without having thought much about the sun when it was shining She begins to swim in the sea on her own for the first time Another example of her awakening And tells Robert that she was moved by the piano playing He responds saying there are spirits in the air He says, quote, On the 28th of August at the hour of midnight and if the moon is shining, the moon must be shining. A spirit that has haunted these shores for ages rises up from the gulf. With its own penetrating vision, the spirit seeks someone mortal, worthy to hold him company, worthy of being exalted for a few hours into the realms of the semi-celestials. His search has always hitherto been fruitless, and he has sunk back, disheartened, into the sea. But tonight he found Mrs. Pontellier. Perhaps he will never wholly release her from the spell. Perhaps she will never again suffer a poor, unworthy earthling to walk in the shadow of her divine presence. And I'm thinking, well, wow, what a chat up line. Now, Edna decides to sleep outside on the hammock and Robert asks to stay with her until Mr. Pontellier arrives. He says nothing but smokes a cigarette and she reflects that, quote, no multitude of words could have been more significant than those moments of silence or more pregnant with the first felt throbbings of desire. Now, Edna's husband, Leonce, isn't happy that she is out there, but she is insistent and puts her foot down for perhaps the first time in her married life. He smokes cigars and drinks wine in silent protest. The next day, Robert suggests to Edna that they go to a trip to, quote, climb up the hill to the old fort and look at the little wriggling gold snakes and watch the lizards sun themselves. I'm thinking romance is definitely in the air. Now, Robert announces at the table that he is going to Mexico. This shocks everyone, including Edna, who's in great shock at the news. She asks him when he's going, and he responds with 20 minutes. The close omniscient narrator states, quote, he lit a match and looked at his watch. In 20 minutes, the sudden and brief flare of the match emphasised the darkness for a while. Of course, this is the darkness of her heart, and Robert is just that brief flare of light of hope in her dark and unromantic life. She fights back tears, quote, her eyes were brimming with tears. For the first time, she recognised the symptoms of infatuation which she had felt incipiently as a child, as a young girl in her earliest teens and later as a young woman. So she really is in love with this Robert, and now he's leaving for Mexico. He does intimate that she may be the reason for his departure. She's a married woman, and if he is in love with her, this would make sense. When Edna says that she was looking forward to seeing him next winter, we have from Robert, quote, So was I, he blurted. Perhaps that's the... And then he breaks off his words. The fact that this was blurted, implying a lack of consciousness in one's thought construction, really does imply that he is deeply in love with Edna too. Edna, duly mopes, looks at photos of Robert in Madame Lebrun's photo album and engages various people, including her husband, on the Robert topic. She learns from Mademoiselle Riche that Robert had a fight with his brother, Victor, over Maria Quita, a Spanish girl in the friendship group. Then we move to New Orleans with Edna and Leonce and the twins. We have a beautiful description of the house. Quote, 
It was a large double cottage with a broad front veranda whose round fluted columns supported the sloping roof. The house was painted a dazzling white. The outside shutters or jalousies were green. In the yard, which was kept scrupulously neat, were flowers and plants of every description which flourishes in South Louisiana. Sounds absolutely wonderful. And she begins to assert her independence, and this irks Leonce when he finds that she has left the house on a Tuesday. Quote, People don't do such things. We've got to observe les convenances if we ever expect to get on and keep up with the procession. If you felt that you had to leave home this afternoon, you should have left some suitable explanation for your absence. Seems like keeping up the Joneses is very much Leonce's things. More on that later. Anyway, he complains of the dinner and he leaves her on her own and he goes to eat at the club. This makes her very uncomfortable and understandably unhappy. She stares out the window in her house. Quote, It was a large, beautiful room, rich and picturesque in the soft, dim light which the maid had turned low. She went and stood at an open window and looked out upon the deep tangle of the garden below. All the mystery and witchery of the night seemed to have gathered there amid the perfumes and the dusky and tortuous outlines of flowers and foliage. She was seeking herself and finding herself in just such sweet half-darkness which met her moods. But the voices were not soothing that came to her from the darkness and the sky above and the stars. They jeered and sounded mournful notes without promise, devoid even of hope. She turned back into the room and began to walk to and fro down its whole length without stopping, without resting. She carried in her hands a thin handkerchief which she tore into ribbons, rolled into a ball and flung from her. Once she stopped and taking off her wedding ring, flung it on the carpet. When she saw it lying there, she stamped her heel upon it, striving to crush it. But her small boot heel did not make an indenture, not a mark upon the little glittering circlet. She is manacled. She really feels that she can't break the ties of marriage that has such a hold on her. By the way, if you're wondering who's looking after the Pontellier children, they are wealthy enough to have a nursemaid, a cook, a maid and a cleaning boy called Joe. Anyway, she is still mourning the loss of Robert. Quote, it was not that she dwelt upon details of their acquaintance or recalled in any special or peculiar way his personality. It was his being, his existence, which dominated her thought, fading sometimes as if it would melt into the mist of the forgotten, reviving again with an intensity which filled her with an incomprehensible longing. Poor, lonely Edna. Now, she goes to visit her friend Adele, who lives nearby, and she thinks how perfectly matched she and her husband are. Quote, if ever the fusion of two human beings into one has been accomplished on this sphere, it was surely in their union. But ultimately, she thinks their life together is a bit dull and boring. She feels, quote, a pity for that colourless existence which never uplifted its possessor beyond the region of blind contentment, in which no moment of anguish ever visited a soul, in which she would never have the taste of life's delirium. And there ends the first half. Some very interesting ideas to come out of that very first half. Initial thoughts. I can understand that Edna feels shackled to a loveless marriage, but I can also see that she's quite blind to the plight of all her manservants and maidservants. They're completely beneath her and she hardly acknowledges them. They wonder if she will get together with Robert in the second half and manage to break free of her marriage to Leonce. Let's see. Now we hear this interesting articulation on the power of past, present and future in Edna's life. When Robert says he's leaving, Edna is miserable. The close omniscient narrator says, quote, The past was nothing to her, offered no lesson which she was willing to heed. The future was a mystery which she never attempted to penetrate. The present alone was significant, was hers, to torture her as it was doing then with the biting conviction that she had lost that which she had held, that she had been denied that which her impassioned and newly awakened being demanded. And we've got some interesting comments on possessions. Does this remind you of anyone? Quote, Mr. Pontellier was very fond of walking about his house, examining its various appointments and details to see that nothing was amiss. He greatly valued his possessions, chiefly because they were his, and derived a genuine pleasure from contemplating a painting, a statuette, a rare lace curtain, no matter what after he had bought it and placed it among his household goods. Yes, 
Ivan Ilyich, he was a lover of possessions too. Edna, I suppose, is just another possession. Remember how he got angry when she stayed out too long in the sun? Now later he decides he wants to buy some new fixtures for his library. Edna states, quote, I hardly think we need new fixtures, Leonce. Don't let us get anything new. You are too extravagant. I don't believe you ever think of saving or putting by. And he says, the way to become rich is to make money, my dear Edna, not to save it. He regretted that she did not feel inclined to go with him and select new fixtures. Can't you see you're about to lose your greatest possession? Well, this is the way he views Edna. The greatest possession, your wife. Edna obviously feels incredibly shackled. Remember when she drops her wedding ring and tries to crush it into the carpet? Quote, but not a mark is left upon the little glittering circlet. She's shackled by this marriage that she's in where she's being possessed by Leonce. Some interesting ideas on happiness in the novel. Quote, there were days when she was very happy without knowing why. She was happy to be alive and breathing when her whole being seemed to be one with the sunlight, the colour, the odours, the luxuriant warmth of some perfect southern day. She liked them to wander alone into strange and unfamiliar places. She discovered many a sunny, sleepy corner, fashion to dream in and she found it good to dream and to be alone and unmolested she really does know how to find happiness hopefully she will find a way to become happy in her marriage it's interesting her maidservants they they're all the way through the narrative and we have very very quiet and beautiful work of these household staff they look after the children and they tend to the house. At one point, the, quote, quadroon, which is an offensive term, is used to pose for Edna's art projects. She also refers to her with very racist and demeaning language. She calls her the quadroon, which is racist as it is. And she's never mentioned by name. She says, quote, the quadroon, she sat for her art project as, quote, patient as a savage. I mean, you've got to be pretty unempathetic to think that, surely. I sometimes wonder whether these people are more deserving of awakening and freedom than this rather spoiled and narcissistic and perhaps self-indulgent Edna. What do you think? Do you think Edna's a little bit self-indulgent? Do share your ideas about the novel so far. I read a few interesting articles about last month's book, The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Leo Tolstoy. In particular, I read a very interesting article by Nicholas Lezard in The Guardian. He says, quote, Ilyich is assumed by most commentators to be the kind of man who deserves to see his life as an increasingly ghastly blunder, but there is scant evidence in the text for this. You might not have wanted to come up against him in court, you feel, but he is no more than averagely inconsiderate or fake. His delusions are no different from yours, mine, or for that matter, Fyodor Vasilyevich's. That's what makes the book so astonishing. Thanks very much for listening. If you've got any thoughts on The Awakening so far, I'd love to hear them. Send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. And as soon as I finish the book, I'll upload my thoughts at the next podcast. See you in a few weeks at the next episode. Mm-hmm.